Marks the Man After a century of myths and counter-myths, of deification and demonizing, it is hard to realize that behind all the portraits and caricatures to be seen on printed pages and on banners, there really was a flesh-and-blood human being named Karl Marx. He was born in the little German town of Trier in the Rhineland in 1818, in a three-story townhouse in a fashionable part of town. A baron lived nearby, and his four-year-old daughter was destined to become Karl Marx's wife. The people who signed as witnesses on Karl Marx's birth certificate were prominent citizens. The Marxes, like their neighbors and friends, had servants, property, education, and local prominence. Unlike most of their neighbors and friends, however, both Heinrich Marx and his wife Henrietta were descended from a long line of rabbis. Indeed, the town's chief rabbi was his brother, but they were brothers estranged from each other, since Heinrich Marx had abandoned the faith of his fathers. Karl Marx was baptized a Lutheran, and throughout his life he spoke of Jews in the third person, and seldom complimentarily. Marx was the third child born in his family, the second to survive, and the oldest boy. Younger brothers and sisters were born annually for the next four years, and then two more at two-year intervals. The father was a prosperous lawyer, who also owned vineyards, as well as houses whose rents supplemented his income. He was a man of wide culture and political liberalism. His son idolized him, and in later years spoke of him often to his own children though they had never seen him, his death having occurred decades before. Marx's mother was Dutch and spoke German with a heavy Dutch accent. She was a devoted housewife, not a woman of learning, and though her son loved her in childhood, they were soon estranged in his early adulthood. When she died, many years later, Marx expressed not the slightest sorrow. Youth Karl Marx grew up a brilliant, spoiled child who bullied his younger sisters and taunted his schoolmates with sarcastic witticisms, in addition to entertaining both with imaginative stories. He had a swarthy complexion that in later years earned him the nickname The Moor, a name used far more often in his inner circle, including his children, than was his real name. His neighbor, Baron von Westphalen, took a great interest in Marx as a youth and the learned baron would often take long walks with him discussing Homer, Shakespeare, Voltaire, or other great writers in any of a number of languages that the baron spoke. As a young man, Karl Marx attended the University of Bonn for one year. There he was an enthusiastic student, but also an enthusiastic drinker, and took part in rowdiness and at least one duel. His father transferred him to the University of Berlin, a larger and more serious institution. But the self-indulgent bohemian and spendthrift habits that Marx had exhibited at Bonn continued at Berlin, where he was sued several times for non-payment of debts. His father's letters show growing recriminations directed not only at his son's prodigious capacity to waste money, a talent he never lost throughout his life, but also at a more disturbing personal characteristic, egomania. One of Marx's many poems of this period says, Then I will wander godlike and victorious through the ruins of the world, and, giving my words an active force, I will feel equal to the Creator. The themes of destruction, corruption, and savagery run through Marx's poems of this era, two of which were published in a small literary magazine of the time under the title Savage Songs. There was nothing political about these writings. Marx had not yet turned his attention in that direction. He was simply, as one biographer said, a man with the peculiar faculty for relishing disaster. A contemporary description of Marx as a student depicts the same demonic personality, again not yet in a political context. But who advances here full of impetuosity? It is a dark form from Trier, an unleashed monster. With self-assured step he hammers the ground with his heels, and raises his arms in all fury to heaven, as though he wished to seize the celestial vault and lower it to earth. In rage he continually deals with his redoubtable fist, 
as if a thousand devils were gripping his hair. In short, Marx's angry apocalyptic visions existed before he discovered capitalism as the focus of such visions. Marx entered the University of Berlin a few years after the death of its most famous professor, G. W. F. Hegel, whose posthumous influence was even greater than during his lifetime. Marx began to associate with a group called the Young Hegelians, who were preoccupied with philosophy in general and religion in particular, or rather with atheism, for they were radical critics of Christianity. Marx's formal studies languished. He took only two courses in his last three years at the University of Berlin. Marx became a bohemian student who merely regarded the university as his camping ground, and he was largely self-taught. The death of his father in 1838 and his long engagement to Jenny von Westphalen eventually made it necessary that he prepare to bring his studies to a close. Although he had studied at the University of Berlin, he applied for a doctorate at the University of Jena, an easier institution, noted as a diploma mill. His doctoral dissertation was on two ancient materialist philosophers, Democritus and Epicurus. Early Career Searching aimlessly for a career, Marx drifted into journalism and became editor of Rheinische Zeitung, a liberal newspaper reflecting Marx's own political views at that time, as well as that of the Rhineland middle class in general. Under the Prussian repression of that era, liberalism was an embattled and endangered creed, and Marx made the newspaper more controversial and more widely read than before. His running of the paper was characterized by a contemporary as a dictatorship of Marx, as so many groups with which he was affiliated would be throughout his lifetime. Another contemporary described him as domineering, impetuous, passionate, full of boundless self-confidence. Marx engaged in a running battle of wits with the government's censors and, ironically, tried to restrain some of the more radical of the newspaper's writers. Among these was another young man from an affluent background named Moses Hess, a communist who eventually converted still another such offspring of wealth to communism, Friedrich Engels. Marx, however, purged Hess from the newspaper for his smuggling into the newspaper of communist and socialist dogmas disguised as theatrical criticism. Only after Marx finally resigned as editor to spare the paper from being banned did he begin the studies that would eventually lead him to communism. During the same period in the early 1840s, Marx had a decisive break with his family. Now that his father was dead and the estate had to suffice for eight people to live on, Frau Marx was not inclined to continue indefinitely sending money to her eldest son, now fully grown and holding a doctoral degree. Marx had continued his already long-standing practice of running up bills that he could not pay, and was outraged that his mother cut off his remaining small allowance. As he put it in a letter to a friend, Although they are quite rich, my family has placed difficulties in my way which have temporarily placed me in an embarrassing situation. Such temporary embarrassments were to become a permanent feature of Marx's life over the next four decades. Nevertheless, he eventually persuaded the aristocratic von Westphalens to let him marry their daughter, now twenty-nine years old, who had waited faithfully for him for seven years. It was not a marriage whose prospects were viewed with favor by either family. There was a church wedding in 1843, but most of her family and all of his family stayed away. However, the bride's mother paid for the honeymoon and, in addition, turned over to the couple a small legacy which she had received. This legacy was held in the form of coins in a strongbox, which Marx and his bride then left open in their hotel rooms, inviting any visitors to take whatever they might need. It was empty before they returned to her home, where they lived with her mother for several months. In October 1843, Marx and his wife, now pregnant, moved to Paris, where he was hired to contribute to a publishing venture, a bilingual journal for German and French readers. Only one issue ever appeared. Marx and the editor quarreled and broke up, 
leaving marks without funds in a foreign land. A collection was hastily taken up by friends in Cologne, and the couple was rescued, as they would be again and again throughout their lives. Here in Paris, Marx began the studies that led him to communism. He also began to meet other radical figures of the time, including the radical poet Heinrich Heine, Russian anarchist Mikhail Bakunin, and the French radical writer Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. Heine, though at first a great friend of the Marxes, was eventually alienated by Karl Marx's arrogance and dogmatism. In later years, Heine described the Paris radicals, including Marx, as a crowd of godless, self-appointed gods. Among these radicals was a young German whom Marx had met briefly before, Friedrich Engels. Collaboration with Engels Engels, two years younger than Marx, came from an even wealthier family, which owned half-interest in a factory in Germany and half-interest in another factory in England. His father had never been as indulgent as Marx's father, and Engels never attended a university, but he was well-read, and by middle age could read and write nearly two dozen languages. Engels was sent away at seventeen to get on-the-job training in the family business in Bremen. Here he was not overworked. He was, after all, an owner's son, and was known to have beer, cigars, poems, and correspondence with him, and to take a leisurely lunch and a nap afterwards in a hammock. He also found time to study Hegel. Engels eventually became a member of the Young Hegelians, and in 1842 had his first brief meeting with the editor of the Rheinische Zeitung, Karl Marx. Their first meeting was cool, for Marx viewed Engels at that point as just another member of the radical group whose literary contributions to the paper were causing him trouble with the censors. From 1842 to 1844, Engels lived in Manchester, England, working in the family business there and observing the conditions of the working people in this industrial town, observations which led to his first book, The Conditions of the Working Class in England, in 1844. When he passed through Paris on his way back to the Rhineland in 1844, he again met Marx, and this time many days of discussion found them in complete agreement on questions of theory, as they continued to be for the remaining decades of their lives. At this juncture, Engels was not only further advanced than Marx on the road to communism, but was also much better versed in economics. Although their first joint publication, The Holy Family, appeared a year later, there was at that point no suggestion of a continuing collaboration between them. The foreword to The Holy Family promised future writings from the pair, each for himself, of course. But in reality, later events brought them together again in England, in a permanent alliance in which their ideas and words were so intermingled that it would be rash to say conclusively, a hundred years later, what was Marx's and what was Engels. Even Marx's daughter, after his death, mistakenly published a collection of her father's newspaper articles that later turned out all to have been written by Engels. The most famous of their explicitly collaborative writings was, of course, the Communist Manifesto. Its genesis typified the pattern of Marxian political intrigue. A radical organization in London, called the League of the Just, was in process of reorganization to become the Communist League, and it involved several people in the drawing up of its credo. One of these submitted his draft to Engels, who confessed to Marx that, just between ourselves, I played a hellish trick on Mosi, substituting the Marxian program for the draft entrusted to him. Engels realized the enormity of his betrayal, for he cautioned Marx to utter secrecy. Otherwise, we shall be deposed, and there will be a murderous scandal. Thus, Marx and Engels made themselves the voices of communism. Engels wrote up a document in question-and-answer format, but then decided that he did not like it. He turned his work over to Marx to redo in some other format, and suggested the title, The Communist Manifesto. Slowly the document evolved, written mostly in the style of Marx, though reproducing some ideas from Engels' earlier draft. It was published in February 1848 as The Manifesto of the Communist Party, with no authors listed, 
as though it were the work of some major organization rather than of a relative handful of radical refugees. The members of the Communist League were overwhelmingly intellectuals and professionals, with very few skilled craftsmen. Their average age was under thirty. It had the same kind of social composition that would in later years characterize the so-called International Working Men's Association, and many other radical groups in which the youthful offspring of privilege called themselves the proletariat. When Engels was elected as delegate to the Communist League in 1847, in order to conceal what was in fact an unopposed election, in Engels' own words, a working man was proposed for appearance's sake, but those who proposed him voted for me. Ironically, the year 1848 was a year of revolutions, but revolutions which differed from that described in the Communist Manifesto. The bourgeoisie and the proletariat were in revolutionary alliance against the autocratic European governments on the continent. During the upheavals that swept across Europe, Marx and Engels returned to Germany, Marx to edit a newspaper, the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, in his familiar dictatorial style. Engels worked at first as his chief assistant, until he had to flee in order for his arrest for inciting to violence. Engels made his way through France to Switzerland, enjoying along the way the sweetest grapes and loveliest of girls. This continued Engels' long-lasting pattern of womanizing, which included the wife of a fellow communist whose seduction he revealed to another communist, when in my cups. He was particularly fond of French women, reporting to Marx in 1846, some delicious encounters with grisettes, and later observing, if I had an income of five thousand francs, I would do nothing but work and amuse myself with women until I went to pieces. If there were no French women, life wouldn't be worth living. In 1849, Engels returned to Germany, where the revolution was being suppressed, and took part in armed fighting against the government forces. An expulsion order was issued against Marx, who had to liquidate the newspaper with ruinous financial losses. By the latter half of 1849, Marx and Engels had separately made their ways to England, where they were destined to spend the rest of their lives. Exiles the dream of returning to the continent in triumph, after revolutions there, continued to fascinate Marx and Engels. One scholar has counted more than forty anticipations of impending revolution in their letters and writings over the next thirty years, none of which materialized. But, as early as 1850, Marx and Engels had to begin making some preparations for a livelihood in England. Marx was then thirty-two, Engels thirty, and neither of them had ever been self-supporting. They had lived off allowances and gifts from their families, including Marx's wife's family, off small inheritances from relatives, the sale of belongings, borrowings, credit defaults, emergency collections among friends and colleagues, and a few scattered and meager earnings from their writings. Now most of these sources had dried up. Both Marx and Engels were estranged from their families who were as disappointed at their prolonged dependency as they were repelled by their doctrines. Still, as late as 1849, Marx's much-despised mother advanced him enough money from his future inheritance to enable him to live comfortably for years, though in fact it was all gone within one year, much of it spent to buy arms for abortive uprisings and to finance Marx's newspaper. Engels' pious father, described by the younger Engels as bigoted and despotic, nevertheless supported him financially. At age thirty, Engels accepted his father's offer to work in the family business in Manchester. This became the source of Engels' livelihood, and much of Marx's. The young Engels called it forced labor, a painfully ironic term in view of what that phrase was to come to mean in twentieth-century communist societies. Engels complained, for example, that I've now got to be at the office no later than ten in the morning. The firm, in which Engels' father had half-interest, employed about eight hundred workers. Though Engels began on a modest level in the management, his position and his pay rose over the years until he was able to retire at age fifty with substantial funds for himself 
and at the same time provide a very generous annuity that relieved Marx of financial worry for the rest of his life. But before reaching that point, the financial position of Marx and his growing family was often dire and occasionally desperate. In 1850, the Marx family moved into the slums of London, where they spent most of the next twenty years. During this time, it was often difficult for Marx to come up with the money to pay the rent, buy groceries, or pay his bills. The family often dodged creditors, were evicted for non-payment of rent, on some occasions had to live on bread and potatoes, frequently pawned their meager belongings, and had three children die amid the squalor, including one for whom there was no money for a burial until a gift was received for that purpose. Yet, despite the very real and very painful poverty in which Marx often found himself, his known sources of income were sufficient for a lower-middle-class family standard of living at that time, and was about three times the income of an unskilled worker. A contemporary German exile with a similar income to Marx's boasted of eating luscious beefsteak regularly. Marx's only regular earnings were as a foreign correspondent for the New York Tribune, but Engels supplemented this even in the early years before his own finances were solid, and other gifts and inheritances added materially to Marx's resources. The problem was Marx's chronic inability to manage money, and especially his and his wife's tendency to splurge when large sums came in. Moreover, Marx spent at least one hundred pounds on a futile lawsuit against an obscure slanderer named Vogt, enough to support a family for months in those times, and wasted still more money and time on a long-forgotten book of rebuttal called Herr Vogt, for which he was sued in court to collect the unpaid costs of publication. In 1864, Marx received a number of inheritances that added up to ten times what he had been living on annually, and yet he was still debt-ridden in 1868, when Engels came to his rescue by paying off Marx's debts and then giving him an annuity. Ironically, Marx's most important research and writing were done during these years of travail and heartbreak, and he produced little during the last dozen or so years of his life when he led a prosperous bourgeois existence. During the 1850s, he buried himself in the reading room of the British Museum during the day, studying economics. Until late at night and into the wee hours of the morning, he scribbled the voluminous manuscripts that represented several abortive attempts to write the book that eventually emerged as Capital. Engels wrote little during this period, when he was working as a capitalist in Manchester and underwriting Marx's efforts in the communist cause of overthrowing capitalism. Physical ills dogged Marx increasingly with the passing years. His irregular sleeping habits, alcohol consumption, and lack of personal cleanliness or exercise may well have contributed to these, as his improvidence made his family prey to hunger, disease, and the deaths of three children in infancy and early childhood. But he blamed these tragedies, like most of his troubles, on other people. The death of his infant son he blamed on bourgeois misery, which he apparently considered also the cause of the boils that covered his body, for he promised to make the bourgeoisie pay for them via his revolutionary writings. Marx repeatedly denounced creditors who insisted on collecting what he owed them. He even lost his temper at his wife for her bouts of tears in the midst of mounting tragedies. Even during the long years of poverty, the Marx household had a maid, Helene de Muth, better known by her nickname of Lenchen. She had been a servant of the elder Baroness von Westphalen, who, in 1845, sent her as a present to her daughter, who was unprepared to take care of children or a household. Though the Marxes were seldom in a position to pay her, dear, faithful Lenchen remained in their service till their dying days, and then went to work for Engels. In her youth she passed up suitors and other opportunities for jobs to stay and serve the Marxes. In 1851, during the most desperate period of the Marx family, when Marx's wife was pregnant, Lenchen soon became pregnant too. Only a few friends knew of the child's birth. He was sent away to be raised by a working-class family, and there was no father's name on the birth certificate. Marx's wife was told that Engels, a bachelor, was the father. In 
but long after the deaths of Marx and his wife, it came out that in fact the father was Karl Marx. Engels confirmed it on his deathbed to Marx's tearful daughter. In his life he had taken the blame for Marx, in order to save his friend's marriage, but in death Engels was apparently not prepared to take the blame forever. The child himself, Freddy de Muth, grew up with no relationship with Marx and never visited his mother as long as the Marxes were alive. Only after their deaths, when Helene de Muth became Engels' housekeeper, did the boy begin visiting his mother, entering and leaving by the back door. He was sacrificed first to Marx's convenience, then to Marx's image. His mother apparently loved him. When she died, she left everything to him. Marx's human relationships in general were self-centered, if not exploitative. When his wife gave birth to a child who died immediately, Marx briefly mentioned his own reactions in a letter to Engels, so totally ignoring the effect on his wife that Engels' reply reminded him that, you don't say how she is. In 1851, at the age of 33, Marx wrote to my mother, threatening to draw bills on her, and, in the event of non-payment, going to Prussia and letting myself be locked up. When his mother refused to be blackmailed this way, Marx complained of her insolent reply. After his mother later died in 1863, Marx's letter to Engels was a model of brevity, wasting no sentiment on the old woman, and focusing entirely on getting his inheritance immediately. Nor was this the only occasion when death in the family was seen in purely economic terms. Earlier, in 1852, he referred to some good news, the illness of my wife's indestructible uncle, and added, if that dog dies now, I'll be out of trouble financially. Because Marx wanted German socialist Ferdinand Lassalle to find me some literary business in Germany to supplant my diminished income and increased expenditure, he cultivated him with flattery to his face and contempt behind his back. Marx referred to Lassalle's book on Hegel as an exhibition of enormous erudition when writing to Lassalle and as a silly concoction when writing to Engels. Marx added that LaSalle was a Jewish nigger, based on Marx's analysis of his appearance. It is now perfectly clear to me that, as testified also by his cranial formation and hair growth, he is descended from the Negroes who joined Moses' exodus from Egypt, unless his paternal mother or grandmother was crossed with a nigger. Well, this combination of Jewish and Germanic stock with the Negroid basic substance is bound to yield a strange product. The fellow's importunity is also nigger-like. Engels likewise seized upon LaSalle's ancestry, called him a true Jew, and from first to last the stupid yid. Crude and repulsive as Marx's and Engels' racial remarks to each other often were, there is no need to make them still worse by putting them in the same category as twentieth-century racism that has justified genocide. Marx's much-criticized essay on the Jewish question, for example, contains clear statements of his distaste for what he considered to be Jewish cultural or social traits, but in the end it was a defense of Jews' right to full political equality written as a reply to a contemporary who had claimed that Jews should be required to give up their religion before receiving equal civil status. Marx hoped that the characteristics he disliked in Jews would fade away with the disappearance of capitalism, thus leading to abolishing the essence of Jewry, but hardly in the sense of Hitler and the Nazis. Similarly, despite his anti-Negro stereotypes, during the American Civil War, he conducted propaganda for the North and for the emancipation of slaves. Perhaps more indicative, he agreed to the marriage of his eldest daughter to a man known to have some Negro ancestry, after discouraging other suitors. Likewise, Engels, in 1851, expressed to a friend his hope that the present persecution of Jews in Germany will spread no further. Marx and Engels were, in short, inconsistent and privately crude, but hardly racial fanatics. The First International, 1848-1949 
Along with the Communist Manifesto and Capital, the other milestone in Marx's career was his leadership of the First International, the International Working Men's Association. Marx's legendary fame today makes it difficult to realize that he was an obscure figure with no substantial following in the early 1860s, that his writings were largely ignored, and that even a man as knowledgeable as John Stuart Mill could live for twenty years in the same city, writing on the same topics, in utter ignorance that someone named Karl Marx even existed. The International Working Men's Association rescued him from that obscurity. As in the earlier case of the Communist League, Marx appeared on the scene just as an existing organization was in process of reorganizing, and seized the opportunity to maneuver his way to control. Initially, Marx was only one of a number of people on a committee charged with drafting a statement of purpose for the International in 1864. He had taken no active part in the organization before was only belatedly brought into the discussions, and was mentioned last on the list of participants. Yet Marx was able to get the group bogged down in interminable discussions, as a prelude to his coup. As he described it in a letter to Engels, In order to gain time, I proposed that before we edited the preamble, we should discuss the rules. This was done. It was an hour after midnight before the first of the forty rules were agreed to. Creamer said, and this was what I was aiming for, we have nothing to show the committee, which meets on October 25th. We must postpone the meeting to November 1st. But the subcommittee can get together on October 27th and attempt to reach a definite conclusion. This was agreed to, and the documents were sent back for my opinion. From here on, it was Marx's show. On a pretext, Marx's own word, I altered the whole preamble, threw out the Déclaration de Principe, and finally replaced the forty rules with ten. He then maneuvered some Marxists into key positions in the new organization, and by 1867 was writing to Engels of this powerful machinery in our hands, and of his own influence from behind the scenes. The membership of the International was, however, never predominantly Marxist, and conflicting currents were always at work. Engels only hoped that the next International would become communist and openly proclaim our principles. Eventually, the commanding figure of the Russian revolutionary anarchist Mikhail Bakunin rose to challenge Marx for control of the International. Their struggle for control ultimately destroyed the organization. Marx managed to get Bakunin expelled and had the headquarters of the International transferred to the United States, where it would be safe from other European revolutionary challenges, even though he knew that would also mean its demise as well. It was a rule or ruin tactic that would appear again and again in later communist infiltrations of non-communist organizations. Twilight Years in the decade that remained of his life after the destruction of the International, Marx published little. His financial worries were largely behind him, but illnesses plagued him and his wife. The completion of capital was delayed not only by illness, but also by Marx's side excursions into other subjects, notably the history of Russia, which required him to learn the Russian language. Even Engels did not know that Marx had let the manuscripts of volumes two and three of Capital sit untouched for years while he dallied with other matters. When Engels discovered this after Marx's death, he said that if I had been aware of this, I would not have let him rest day or night until everything had been finished and printed. Engels had been vainly urging Marx since 1845 to finish the projected book on economics. As it was, much of the last two decades of Engels' life were taken up trying to decipher and assemble the manuscripts for the remaining two volumes of Capital. Realizing the monumental task that this involved, and his own advancing age, Engels initiated the young Karl Kautsky into the mysteries of Marx's handwriting, enabling Kautsky to eventually assemble the remaining manuscripts into Theories of Surplus Value, a separate three-volume work originally intended by Marx as the final volume of Capital. <laughs>
Thus, a work begun in the middle of the nineteenth century was not completely published until the end of the first decade of the twentieth century. Marx once observed that all his earnings from capital would not pay for the cigars he smoked while writing it. It took four years to sell one thousand copies, and though translations began to appear with the passing years, Marx remained in his lifetime a little-known figure outside the ranks of revolutionaries. His greatest notoriety came as a defender of the bloody activities of the Paris Commune of 1871. His book on the subject, The Civil War in France, sold far more copies than the Communist Manifesto. Marx relished this public notoriety, though it also included death threats. The Marx family, even after being relieved from dire poverty, had many rocky roads to travel. Marx's wife, a beauty in her youth, found herself with a pockmarked face as a result of illness. In her words, looking more like a kind of rhinoceros which has escaped from a zoo than a member of the Caucasian race. She remained a nervous wreck and irritable with her children as a result of decades of strain, for which her pampered upbringing had not prepared her, while her mother's servant, Helene de Muth, had been a godsend to a young wife unable to take care of children, money, or a household, Lenchen's handling of these responsibilities may also have retarded or prevented Jenny Marks from maturing. Her immaturity was still evident long after she ceased to be young. At age fifty, she realized a lifetime ambition by giving a ball, complete with uniformed servants and hired musicians. Even as a middle-aged woman and the wife of a revolutionary, she had visiting cards printed up identifying herself as Baroness von Westphalen. Nor were these the only vanities in which she and Marx indulged. They continued to give their daughters piano lessons, music, and dancing lessons, even when this sometimes meant not paying the rent. Keeping up appearances was a major item in the Marx's budget throughout their lives. During his worst years of financial desperation, Marx strove mightily and with pained embarrassment to prevent visitors from discovering his poverty though Engels pointed out how futile and pointless this was, even when this required his wife to take everything that was not actually screwed down to the pawn shop to pay for entertaining them. During one of his worst financial crises, Marx contemplated the most extreme reduction of expenditure, which might include requiring him to move into purely proletarian accommodation and get rid of the maids. The three Marx daughters all became involved with men unable to support them, two through marriage and one in a common-law relationship. All received money at one time or other from Engels, the eldest to pay overdue rent, the middle daughter repeatedly for a variety of reasons, and the youngest in a large inheritance which she did not live long to enjoy. Marx's relationships with his children and grandchildren, however, show his most happy and human side. He was a gentle and indulgent father, who amused his children with his own original fairy tales, and picnicked and played with them with great relish. The deaths of those who perished in childhood severely affected him for years afterwards. Marx wrote in a letter, Bacon says that really important men have so many contacts with nature and the world, and have so much to interest them, that they easily get over their loss. I am not one of these important men. My child's death has shattered my heart and brain, and I feel the loss as keenly as on the first day. Assessments Marx with his children was a very different man from the Marx described by his adult contemporaries. When his father questioned whether his heart was as good as his head, he raised a question that many others would continue to raise about Marx throughout his life. A fellow revolutionary said of Marx, If his heart had matched his intellect, and if he possessed as much love as hate, I would have gone through fire for him. But a most dangerous personal ambition has eaten away all the good in him. Still another radical contemporary, Proudhon, wrote to Marx, For God's sake, after we have abolished all the dogmatisms a priori, let us not of all things attempt in our turn to instill another kind of dogma into the people. He said, 
Let us have decent and sincere polemics. Let us give the world an example of learned and far-sighted tolerance. But simply because we are at the head of the movement, let us not make ourselves the leader of a new intolerance. Let us not pose as the apostle of a new religion, even though this religion be the religion of logic, the religion of reason. Karl Schurz, while still a youthful revolutionary in Germany, before his later fame as a liberal in the United States, met Marx and formed an opinion of him that accords with the impressions of many others. I have never seen a man whose bearing was so provoking and intolerable. To no opinion which differed from his he accorded the honor of even a condescending consideration. Everyone who contradicted him he treated with abject contempt. Every argument that he did not like he answered either with biting scorn at the unfathomable ignorance that had prompted it, or with appropriate aspersions upon the motives of him who had advanced it. Marx liked to glare at anyone who challenged his conclusions and say, I will annihilate you. The radicals and revolutionaries whom Marx successively alienated over a period of forty years reads like a who's who of the nineteenth-century political left. Even the patient and long-suffering Engels came close to a break with Marx, whose curt and clumsy remarks on the death of Engels' common-law wife in 1863 wounded his friend. Engels wrote, All my friends, including Philistine acquaintances, have shown me more sympathy and friendship on this occasion, which inevitably affected me quite closely, than I had a right to expect. You found the moment suitable for a demonstration of the superiority of your cool manner of thinking. So be it. Marx's apology brought forgiveness, and the historic partnership continued. The younger Marx of the 1840s presented a more humane vision in his writings, and has become something of a refuge for modern radicals disillusioned with the more blatantly severe later Marx, who seemed to presage Lenin and Stalin. Light-hearted humor also brightened some of these earlier writings in a way seldom seen again in the later works of Marx and Engels. Yet it would be a mistake to ignore the authoritarian and terroristic elements that were as present in these earlier writings as in the later ones, and in Engels as well as Marx. Engels' first draft for the Communist Manifesto included compulsory labor, a deliberate undermining of the family by ending the dependence of the wife upon the husband and of the children upon the parents, and the erection of common dwellings for communities of citizens to replace family homes. Marx's Neurheinische Zeitung declared on its last day of publication, When our turn comes, we shall not disguise our terrorism. A current vogue, aptly characterized as Engels baiting, makes it especially important to assess Engels' role in Marxism. Engels was much more than Marx's friend and benefactor. He was one of the very few people with whom Marx had intellectual interchange, and by far the most important. For most of his life, Marx, as an obscure autodidact, was utterly cut off from participation in the world of universities, learned journals, scholarly conferences, and other institutionalized intellectual exchange. Nor did he have any intellectual interaction, by correspondence or in person, with the leading minds of his time. Mill, Darwin, Tolstoy, Menger, or Dostoevsky, for example. Marx's relationship with contemporary radical intellectuals was one of tutelage or hostility. His correspondence consisted overwhelmingly of gossip, intrigue, and passing remarks on current events and contemporary personalities. Only with Engels were serious intellectual matters discussed with even occasional regularity. Engels' early economic writing provided the basic conception that Marx systematized and elaborated in the massive volumes of Capital. Finally, Engels piecing together and editing of the many manuscripts for the posthumous volumes of Marx's magnum opus was a monumental work of dedication and self-sacrifice, stretching over more than a decade. Engels was not only a far clearer writer than Marx, but often more subtly and accurately conveyed Marx's theories, especially of history, for he did not so readily indulge in Marx's penchant for epigrams at the expense of accuracy. 
Engels' letters on the Marxian theory of history are a major contribution to understanding what Marx actually did in his historical writings, as distinguished from how Marx tried to encapsulate his practice in clichés that continue to obscure more than they reveal. There is no way to know what Engels would have accomplished in the decades he devoted, first to earning a living for both himself and Marx, and then to completing Marx's unfinished work. But what he actually accomplished was both impressive and indicative. His socialism, utopian and scientific, remains the best summary of the system of thought that bears the name of Marx. How much of Marxism originated in fact with Engels is a question that may never be answered. Engels was clearly a precursor of Marxian crisis theory in economics, as Marx himself indicated. Engels' letters to Marx also presage the content and title of Marx's 18th Brumaire. But the collaborative writings of Marx and Engels and their unrecorded conversations over a period of forty years preclude any definitive disentangling of their respective contributions to Marxism. In 1883, at the graveside of Marx, Engels painted an idealized picture that provided the stuff of which legends are made. He began, On the fourteenth day of March, at a quarter to three in the afternoon, the greatest living thinker ceased to think. According to Engels, Marx discovered the law of development of human history and also the special law of motion governing the present-day capitalist mode of production. Innumerable slanders, Marx brushed aside as though it were cobweb, and, though he may have had many opponents, he had hardly one personal enemy. This was at best a highly sanitized picture of a man who personalized every quarrel and whose letters to Engels were full of spiteful gossip and petty intrigues. Finally, Engel's funeral oration ended with these words, His name will endure through the ages, and so also will his work. Marx's name has indeed become infinitely better known than when he died in relative obscurity in London a hundred years ago. How much of what has happened in the twentieth century is his work, and in what sense, is a much larger and more complex question. For Marx the man he perhaps wrote his own best epitaph when he said, Nothing that is human is foreign to me. Others made him an abstraction and an icon.